Well, hello, Canada, and uh, late-night television fans from coast to coast, which now include Newfoundland, who don't have to do that. That's so right. Peter. I'm just saying that meant I was listening to you before 1949, when Newfoundland joined Confederation. But by the time I was listening to you, you had been bro broadcasting, since, well, since... What? Well, 23, so you, you figure that one out. I was a latecomer to, to discovering Foster Hewitt <laughs> in the play, but there were many Saturday nights that uh, my mother thought I was asleep and I was glued to that radio, as it must have been. Uh -huh. uh, has, has television changed your style of announcing or your, or your perceptions of the game? Well, I think so, uh, Peter. I believe that uh, radio, you try to be very uh, accurate and concise and uh, very much to the point of being accurate. And that's why I like television later, because it proved what you were saying was not what you were making up, but what you were actually describing, what was happening on, on the ice. And it's a confirmation of so-called accuracy, which I think is very important in a commentator's ideas. Uh, I think television uh, more or less cuts down the number of words, or should, because you can see uh, two-thirds of the ice. Uh, if I had any uh, critici criticism to offer, uh, which I haven't, but uh, I would just draw to the attention of some commentators that you don't see uh, more than two-thirds of the ice. And many times, a man on either left wing or right wing is out of the picture, and he can be the most dangerous player on the ice. So that uh, you do pick them up when they come in over the blue line going in on goal. But unless you talk about him, the uh, viewer is not actually seeing what's going to happen. And sometimes you miss it. I was just thinking, as when you were talking about the need to be accurate with radio and to continue it with television, I had forgotten the, the wonderful story. We won't mention the person's name, but someone was listening to you on the radio and repeating on another station the Foster Hewitt broadcast of the Leaf game, Maple Leaf games from the gardens, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. On another station, and you... We didn't like it either. No. <laughs> and you cheated. We did uh, twice, right. Uh, we, uh, we did that purposely, and uh, it was... Uh, uh, Labine happened to be the player what, that we chose to score a goal, and he hadn't, of course... You made up a goal? Made up a goal uh, on the basis to see or confirm. We had, uh, we had been uh, complaining to the BBG. Uh, the forerunners of the CRTC. CRTC. Now they're more numerous. Uh, but uh, we had been complaining then about this uh, stealing, more or less, of our broadcast. So they said, well, you have to have evidence. So that was the only way we could see that we would have evidence that if they described two goals that were not scored, they obviously had to get it from us. <laughs> did you give one to each team? One to each. So it was even. Yeah. Did, did the players ever know that you had given them? Does, does oh, they heard about to this day think that he got one goal? That he I think he heard about it afterwards. He was rather thankful that he had scored that game. <laughs> We're going to be meeting very shortly one of the all-time legendary figures of hockey, Cyclone Taylor, who is, this is how far he goes back, you never saw him play. That's true. Uh, I've more or less uh, heard all of his achievements, and uh, there's one question I'd like to ask him. Uh, he always was credited with scoring a goal skating, skating backwards. backwards. I will, that's the very first question we'll ask him. That's will you ask him for me? I will, no, I'll let you ask him, and then at the same time I'm going to ask him if he did it, why he didn't put himself offside. Well, another thing I've heard, that he has denied it once and said he did it the other time. So I want to know which is right. We'll get him tonight, <laughs> but when we're talking about him, I want to know of the, all the players that you have seen from 19... Well, you were going to hockey games before you were announcing them because of oh, your yes. father's involvement right. with the game and everything. Who are your special favorites? Not necessarily the ones who have dominated the game, the Howes and the Richards and the Bobby Holds, but... Well, I, I'd say right off the bat, Howie Morenz was... Uh, perhaps one of the uh, most sensational type of hockey players I've seen in years. Uh, and then there's Eddie Shore for another reason. He was always the villain or the hero. Uh, he was the hero in Boston, of course. But uh, he was a very colorful defense player. And 
rough and ready, and he had about everything you could uh, want in a in color as far as a hockey player is concerned. Well, one of that part of that color didn't isn't he the guy who almost killed Ace Bailey? That's right. Yeah, well, he did everything. He didn't miss a trick. Uh, no, he was that kind of a player. He was always the subject of con controversy, and uh, uh, I don't know, he uh, always was in the spotlight. He had the happy knack. Yeah. And uh, I, I even saw him, uh, I think Clancy, King Clancy, goaded him in a, into a shooting the puck at the referee one time. And, uh, of course, uh, Shore went off, and that's how the Leafs happened to win, the, win that game in the series. Clancy talked... Well, you know, Clancy, he's another char uh, character, and uh, uh, he's, he was quite a talker on the ice, as well as being able to use the stick to advantage. And um, oh, he, got, he could get uh, Shore's goat almost any time he was on the ice. But uh, Clancy always had the happy knack of just being beyond reach every time, so he didn't get hurt. Clancy was not much of a fighter. No, I don't think he ever won a fight. He was in several. But uh, it was Charlie Conacher who always saved his neck. Every time Clancy would get into any kind of a squabble, Charlie Conacher would come over. And that was just like bringing a police force in. That ended it. In, in all those days, in all those games, the great games that, that, that you saw, can you compare today's hockey with then? It, it must be more boring for you now. Oh, I don't, I don't think you can compare because it's a different game. And I think primarily it's a different game from the so-called old days, is that when they changed the rules to the point of putting in the red line at center ice, that was the equivalent, really, in, in football to having the forward pass. And now, instead of carrying the puck, it meant that you were always uh, clearing that puck up to the red line so that you could get in and, well, it made a difference, I would say, of uh, carrying the puck up, it would take you seven seconds. Uh, clearing it up from one zone to the other, it would take you about three seconds. And the whole idea was to, uh, it was taken on the idea of box lacrosse, really, where they were allowed the forward pass, and then all the action was at either end. That's what they were trying to do. And uh, now it causes a great deal of scrambling and everything like that. And it means that the good stick handler is almost unknown. Now you pass that puck instead of carrying it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Soviets are they, uh, and the European teams are perhaps uh, the uh, last teams now to actually carry the puck in. We generally, uh, when I say we, Canadian players generally <clears throat> reach up to the blue line and then they shoot it in and chase after it. Yeah, that drives me to distraction. Well, I don't like it either. But you don't? No, not a bit. Why don't you say so when you're on the television? Stage? I have. <laughs> See, that's dumb. But they don't pay any attention to <laughs> me. So that's dumb. <laughs> well, you've only seen 3,000 hockey games. I'd like to know a little bit more about the way you work. I understand you go to the gardens before and you kind of have a steak before the game, psych yourself up just like a player. Is that right? Oh, no. I, no, I don't eat very much before a game. I, I get jumpy. Oh, yeah? And if I didn't, uh, I don't think I could do it. Oh, no, I get all on edge, and uh, I want to get in the gondola about uh, 45 minutes before the game. And uh, it's just like uh, when I used to box quite a bit. I'd nearly jump out of my skin before I got in the ring. You get all on edge, and you can't hold yourself back. And that's the same way you do now in, in hockey or any... And you description. still do that after all the I years? I still do it, and when I, when I don't do it, I'll be dead. Yeah. <laughs>